<laughs> Good evening and welcome to the school board uh, meeting on January 12, 2010. We all stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Um, Alan, do we have any adjustments to the agenda? The only adjustment that I have is I do have two extracurricular position recommendations that came in from Steve. So I'll just pass these down so you'll have them when we get to that point. And that's the only change that I have at this point. Okay. So we'll add these to um, 7C, is that yes, correct? I think it is 7. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, and um, for the school board minutes? Um, I, I have a question about adjustments to agenda. Is, there is not a clause at the end that, that talks about we can talk about other business, other appropriate items. Is I have a few items that I don't think are of substance, but I wanted to raise. Can I do that at the end uh, between school board, agenda, school board agenda requests or public comments somewhere at the end? Um, it depends on the nature of what you want to talk about because um, we do have to have uh, public notice of items that are going to be discussed. Um, there is a, sp a period at the end where school board members can request that agenda items be added to the next business meeting, but that typically happens when um, a board member has asked the chair and superintendent to add an item to the agenda and it's been refused then they can come to the next school board meeting and um, ask the board to approve an item to be added to the agenda. So if you have information you would like to communicate or do you want um, action on an, any, any particular items? I, well, that's exactly the distinction I would make. But first of all, just so you know, I've read the, uh, the public access laws very closely and they do not require that you put on an agenda before a public hearing. They only require notice of the hearing and, uh, but they don't require you to state the subject that matters at the hearing. Is we can talk about that, that at a later time. My, my things are merely things that have come to my attention in the last 24, 48 hours that I want to raise that, and suggest that if we want to follow up and we then put it on uh, an agenda item. Um, that's a conversation that you can have with the chair and the superintendent at, a, at another time. We typically take those requests before um, we have a planning, uh, agenda planning meeting about a week or so before the next business meeting and um, board members are free to offer ideas and suggestions for items that should be discussed at that next business meeting. So that's what I would request that you do, David, instead of this evening. Okay? Um, I, and, uh, you Kathy wait for did, you to say okay. Oh, sorry. Okay. Thank you. And Kathy um, appropriately reminded me that I um, should welcome our new board members. Um, it's lovely to have uh, Kate Hewitt and John Christie and David Hillman as our new board members. Uh, welcome and uh, look forward to working with all of you. Uh, Linda Winker is uh, out of town on business, so she's not here this evening. Thank you, Kathy. Okay, so. Um, do I have a motion to approve the school board minutes from the Tuesday, December 1st, 2009 meeting? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Six, yes. I do have a motion to approve the school board minutes from the special meeting on Tuesday, December 15th, 2009. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Okay. All those in favor? Six zero. Okay. Great. Okay. Uh, comments by our student representatives. Shall we start with the middle school? Could you just, um, when you come to the poem, state your name and your grade? Um, I'm John Keneally. I'm in eighth grade. I'm Tim Hartel, and I'm also in eighth grade. Uh, some things that have gone on at our school recently. Uh, first was the Scripps National Spelling Bee. Our school had its own spelling bee. Um, 
two students won in first and second place and will be attending the Cumberland County Spelling Bee. First place was Lily Jordan and this in seventh grade, and this is her second time winning, uh, two years in a row. And second place was Alex Mukai. Um, in the conference room, there's going to be a landscape photo painting. The eighth grade trimesters two and three with Laura Rohner, our art teacher, are going to be painting that. Um, on the last Thursday, we had a uh, BMX rally in our gym, um, bike motocross. Um, they actually set up some ramps in uh, our middle school gym and did some tricks to get our attention and then talked about um, drugs and alcohol and gave us some important messages regarding that um, that really, I think, really got across to the students and it can't be said too many times, frankly. The winter band concert for the 5th and 6th graders was on December 7th, and for the 7th and 8th graders, which I was a part of, was on December 14th. It was lots of fun, and there were many people attending. Um, something that a lot of the students have noticed is the food quality in the cafeteria has improved um, quite a lot. Uh, there's a, the new addition of a sandwich bar, where as a meal you can go up and get a sandwich made, which a lot of students like, uh, made to order. There's a salad bar, which is new, that comes with the meal. Uh, so basically, once you get a meal, you get salad free, which has been encouraging the eating of salad. And there's been a lot less grease on the food. Yes, there was. <laughs> and Mr. Esposito will appreciate what you said. <laughs> the dance was great and well attended and overall very fun. Uh, sports, uh, we just had a sports season end, the basketball team, uh, the boys basketball season just ended, girls basketball is just about to start, um, Nordic skiing is going on currently, and indoor track and swimming will start soon. And also, there's been a great increase in writing at the school um, from last year. Uh, we're no longer only writing in language arts class, but we also write very much in science class and social studies class. Um, and in language arts class, we're not writing an essay now and then. We're constantly writing an essay. The day we turn one in, we get a new one. Yep. Um, this is a reminder to parents that on Monday, January 18th, uh, is Martha Luther King Jr. Day, and that school will be closed. Uh, any questions? No? Thank you very much. Very good job. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. From the high school? Um, yeah. So students just got back from winter break and definitely are a bit more refreshed and awake in the classroom. Um, the semester ends this Friday. So with finals being next week, everybody is definitely starting to dread the finals, but realize there's only four weeks till February vacation, so they're counting those down. <laughs> um, and as far as the SEC goes, we are going to have a new president in two weeks when Peter moves on. So that will definitely impact how the SEC goes and how we organize each other. Yeah, um, also on the SEC note, we've uh, talked quite a bit about how we're revamping our student council, um, so it'll be which was pretty much spearheaded by Peter, um, so we all miss him greatly, but we've, uh, it's going to be very efficient next year, I see, even though I won't be a part of it. Um, also, winter sports are underway. We had a big victory for the girls' basketball team against Falmouth, um, which was really exciting to see. All the students out for the, the girls and boys had a um, double header, which was very exciting. And also, after the um, midterms to de-stress, the National Honor Society is hosting a galactic bowling night on Sunday, uh, January 24th, and then there's the semi-formal dance on the next Saturday on the 30th, so it'll hopefully get everyone's spirits up after the, uh, the long push. Does Peter want to speak? Peter, would you like to speak about the changes at the SAC? Uh, I mean, I wasn't planning to, but I'm happy to just speak briefly on them. Basically, the discussion we've been having is about sort of making the SAC a decision-making body that's a little bit more collaborative and provides a greater voice for faculty. And we've also talked for several years about 
sort of concentrating our efforts into smaller subcommittees similar to what the town council and the school board does because we feel we've found that when the SAC breaks into smaller focus groups that really is more effective than having all 25 of us freshmen through seniors in one room trying to make headway on an on a decision and I've been working a lot with Mr. Shedd on this issue and he sort of came to me and presented the challenge to me when I first started as SAC president that often when the SAC feels that it hasn't always achieved the consensus or compromise with the faculty that it would like to, it's been because the model is students sitting in a room talking with other students and there's not sort of a consolidation of the power, those who hold the power as it were. And essentially what we've done is Mr. Shedd and I met and I've also talked extensively with the rest of the SAC and what we'd like to do is, as I said, break the SAC down over the next semester into smaller subcommittees, one focused on extracurricular and curricular issues, another focused on climate, and another one focused on communications from the SAC to the rest of the student body and also between the high school and the community at large and have those groups meeting. And we'd also like to, at some point, include some school board members in the discussions of those smaller committees. And we'd like to incorporate a sort of a larger faculty component and have some consultants, so to speak, from the faculty be a part of that. I know that uh, Mr. Shedd has put in his budget for next year two potential new stipended positions associated with the SAC to serve as consultants for the SAC who would be part of committee discussions and from a sort of personal standpoint that's something that I really hope can survive the difficult budget process this spring because I think a lot of our faculty are eager to be a part of that, a part of the process and a little bit of compensation would certainly be a nice incentive in this Time. So I don't know if there are any further questions, but I would invite members of the board who have an interest in being a part of the discussions, both about shaping the SAC going forward and being a part of whatever new streamlined format we come up with next year. I'd certainly welcome any feedback at any point from any members of the school board or from the community as well. Great. Any other questions? Mary? When do you generally hold your meetings, and um, can we get notice of those meetings? That's definitely something that can happen. Generally, up until this point, we've held meetings early in the morning, around 7 o'clock before school begins, because that's just when a lot of students are free from the commitments that they have with sports and things after school. What we'd like to do now is start having these smaller focus groups meet about once a week, at a time that's convenient for the members of that group and have it be fairly informal and then about once a month have probably a two hour meeting when each committee takes about half an hour to report back on what it's been doing over the past month and get feedback from the, from the other people who are present whether they're part of another group or it's adult members and of the community and we'd like to do those in the evening probably to be more conducive to including school board members faculty, parents, and so forth. Great. Thank you. Thank you very sure. much. C can I say something? Uh, I understand, Peter, you're only going to be uh, president for two more weeks? That's correct. So I will sort of be passing the reins over to a probably a junior student who is elected by the student body. I'll still, the advantage of how the, when the presidency of the SAC is structured is that the president serves typically from the spring semester of his or her junior year through the fall semester of the senior year. And the advantage to that is that it does provide some continuity because I'll be able to stay during the spring and advise the SAC uh, and help transition in whoever is elected to be my replacement. And I also have a lot of confidence in the younger students in the SAC. And one of the things that I'm most proud of is that I feel that there's more enthusiasm among the members of the SAC and also a, gr a greater respect from other students and the faculty for the SAC. So I'm confident that they can take uh, that next you step. You answered me very formally and very completely. I was actually more of an informal question because I wanted to thank you for the work you've done over the past year. I, I Perhaps the board members, the current board members, past board members could, could 
has a more more experience with you, but I've I've known you and, and have worked with you on informal projects and on other discussions, and I know you from the track team, and you've been a great role model for the freshmen, juniors, and seniors. You've done a great job in these meetings. Uh, you've been very involved. I know your workload, and I just think you've done a tremendous job. Great. Well, thank company. you. It's been a real pleasure to have members of the school board involved with the student government and just to work with this school community and be able to be more involved than I other, otherwise would have been. So, oh, thank, thank you. you goes both ways. Thank you very okay. much. And if the middle school representatives would like to adjourn from the meeting now, that's fine. Or you can stay for the whole. I just wanted you to know that you don't have to stay for the whole meeting if you don't want to. Okay. Oh, I mean, how much homework you have. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Peter. Okay. Comments from the public on non-agenda items? Okay. Moving on to recognition. Uh, Alan, we have the AP Government Class Healthcare Reform Forum. Yes, and Jeff Shad has said he would speak to it. Unfortunately, because of other meetings, I didn't get there that evening. <coughs> so Jeff will speak to it briefly. Um, on January 4th in the evening, um, Ted Jordan's AP Government Class um, invited a number of three different people who had a diverse set of views on health care reform legislation that's uh, pending in Washington. It's Andrea Maker, uh, who is the vice president of Main Point, Martin Point Healthcare. Chris Dugan, who is the director of corporate communications for Anthem, Blue Cross, and Blue Shield. And Professor Andy Coburn, um, who is the director of the Institute for Health Policy at the Muskie School. Um, and I remember seeing Julie, Julia there. Yes. Um, and Matt was probably there as well, but I didn't, uh, maybe not, maybe not. I will say that um, it's a complicated topic. Um, there were a lot of juniors there. Um, there were a number, quite a few seniors there as well. Um, I think that the speakers did a really nice job trying to make a really complex topic um, as understandable as they possibly could. Um, the AP government students acted as the moderators of the discussion. Um, they did not have to get up and separate it, anybody. Um, it was very amicable, it was very respectful, um, and in that way it was really sort of a model of what one would hope that a discussion would be like around a complex topic, not quite what it is in Washington these days. Um, so I thought it was very informative. I thought it went very well. I think that the students, as they always do when they do these sorts of forums, did a really, really nice job, and the speakers were, were wonderful. So it's always good to get educated from different points of view. Anybody have any questions? Mary? Um, just a comment to add to that. I received a, an email from Ted Jordan today, and he um, had the event taped, and is going. he's having a DVD made, and the DVD will be sent to Cape Elizabeth Television. That will be broadcast um, in the upcoming week. So Great. I guess watch for that. I was actually going to ask that question because I had the pleasure of attending, and I found it to be very informative and um, enlightening and probably the best um, summary of what we're discussing out of anything that I have read or heard up to date. So I'm very pleased that first our AP government class was the, uh, took the initiative to do this and, and did such a great job. Um, and that too, that's going to be made to, available to um, Cape citizens. So I think that's really great. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Okay. Athletic update? Well, as uh, our high school and our middle school students um, so eloquently stated that uh, we're sort of in that transition point in winter athletics right now. Um, some of them are just finishing and we're really kind of just getting going with uh, a lot of our snow sports. So uh, exciting time and it's beginning to really feel like this with the weather and the snow finally um, feels like we're in that winter, that winter athletic period. So um, a lot of good things happening there and uh, we just finished at the high school level. Um, over the holiday, um, a lot of our tournament participation in uh, basketball and ice hockey. Um, I think there's been a lot of news coverage recently on that topic of uh, the countable play dates and scrimmages. And um, uh, most of the discussion primarily on the uh, safety 
of students play, participating in multiple games in one day. And uh, the one benefit of the holiday tournament, for, for sure, is our, uh, it's the opportunity to really compete against some of these uh, top schools in the state and some of the bigger, larger Class A schools. Um, but I think it does. It definitely, playing multiple games um, in one day, um, especially in a smaller school where our numbers are a little bit smaller, um, it does put a lot of strain on our student athletes. So I hope uh, the main principals association will begin to look at that just a little bit more closely. But um, in all in all, a lot of success there, and uh, um, ready for it's actually a really nice way to uh, move on into that second part of the uh, winter season. So really good stuff. Um, the just found out recently, and some really nice news, and I'd like to commend our uh, girls soccer team uh, for. Their, um, the National Soccer Coaches Association, um, the academic team award they received. And to qualify for that award, uh, you must have a 3.0 or greater on a 4.0 scale. Um, and our girls soccer team has won this award in 2001, 2002, 2003, 2007, and 2009. So it's quite, a, it's quite an accomplishment. And, uh, really speaks well to our student athletes and uh, very proud of them for that accomplishment. And we do have a um, certificate that we'll be able to post uh, in the school and display, but um, I did want to uh, show the board a copy of that. And so I have made a couple copies and on the uh, one side it does give a brief description and the back it has a picture of the, okay. the actual award. So um, I can pass that on the multiple side, serving, pay for that, <laughs> using the copy machine. <laughs> Um, it on the athletic side, I'm not sure. I do have, and I don't want to change the uh, agenda, but I, I do have that uh, basketball game I told Andrea. So I was kind of hoping that if there were any questions on the, there were a couple of extracurricular positions. And I wasn't sure if anyone had questions on that, but I would mentioned to Andrea a couple of weeks ago to kind of put that okay. forward. Uh, if not, so this is. There no, I mean, the, the, the positions on there are all volunteer okay, positions. So these are the we'll athletic fee positions that we're going to be approving. Additional. Yeah, okay. there were just additional volunteer coaches that. And then you have the two new ones. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I see. Which is that? Um, Alan Warren's position. Sure. Sure. Well, if you don't. So I'm not. Or does it mind? Not to change the agenda, but just as a, I, I do, because Sue Weatherby is covering for me so right now, so there. Janet can come back up for her piece. And okay. Uh, yeah. would the, does the board have any objection to moving item 7, B, and C up um, to right now to vote on? That's fine. Okay. So um, do I have a motion um, in regards to the high school athletic fee positions? Or do you want to introduce them? So, Sorry, Alan. Well, no, I'm just going to say that in your packet, there is a sheet from the high school uh, with these uh, positions listed, also with the information about them. It's in the back, back part of the packet. And you also do have, since you also mentioned uh, middle school, and there's also a one-pager plus the one I gave you earlier. So uh, the high school one, have you, have you all been able to find that it looks like this? Yes. Okay. Being new at these packets, it might be. Keep going in the back. I'm just saying, when we get it all done, it's somebody to handwrite numbers, and that way you can just say page 17 of the pack would make it easier for me. Would you like to use mine? So, would, uh, what I normally do is just go down through the whole list, and then can uh, turn to uh, Jeff to speak about any of these. So, what you have for recommendations for extracurricular positions, winter coaches, is uh, Christopher Cantera as assistant Alpine. Uh, he is funded by the Boosters. Uh, this is a new position, and he, uh, this is not a new position, excuse me, and he is a new hire, though, and then there is a brief biographical sketch of him. The second one is J James Preventure, who is Assistant Girls Ice Hockey Volunteer. Again, it's not a new position, but it is a new hire. Again, a brief uh, biography of her work. David Means, Volunteer Assistant Girls Ice Hockey is a volunteer. Uh, it is, again, a position that's already been here, but she's a new hire, and again, brief biographical sketch. 
Brianna Gervais, who is a, a volunteer assistant girls ice hockey coach, the same type of thing as before. Caitlin Flaherty, volunteer assistant girls ice hockey coach, volunteer. Taylor McFarland, assistant swim coach, who is, is paid for by the boosters. And then I have at the bottom Sean Garrett for alpine skiing. Uh, that is funded by student fees. So those are the ones that I have for the high school. And if you would, uh, Jeff would like to speak to any of those pieces at this point in time. Or, or happy to entertain. Yeah, maybe there's any questions. Yeah. So do I have, first do I have a motion um, to consider this item, please? I move that we approve the high school athletic fee positions as presented. Is there a second? Second. Uh, discussion, David? I, I just want to note for the record that uh, in the original packet, or the front part of the packet, uh, James Venture is not listed as being a volunteer, but he is listed in the later material, so I want to make it clear that everybody is a volunteer or student fee funding, that none of this is going to come out of the school budget. And I think it's an important thing to note for the community that we, we do have a good athletic program here, but the vast majority of it is funded uh, not through the taxpayers, but through boosters and volunteers and everything else. And I think there's some misconceptions about that in this town. Uh, so I'm using this opportunity to correct something to make a little speech. Thank you, David. Any other comments or questions? Mm -hmm. Okay. All those in favor? Six zero. Okay. Next is the um, middle school athletic fee positions. And what I have here for middle school is James O'Rourke, eighth grade girls basketball. Uh, it is a position that's been in play. She, he is a new hire. There's a brief biographical sketch about him. While I'm doing this is also the two people that I handed you tonight, which is Z uh, Dean Zaharis and Pear Norius, who are both chess team, and they are splitting the uh, co-curricular stipend, so it's $283.50 a piece uh, for that, uh, that position. Okay. Do I have a motion to consider uh, this? That's actually, uh, yeah, that's okay. Do I have a motion to consider this item? So moved. I didn't make a motion. I thought you said, oh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I could if you'd like. <laughs> I move that we um, approve the extracurricular positions um, funded by CEF as presented. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Comments or questions? I'm a bit confused. Is James' work being funded by? It's a school C funded position. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so, yeah. So, so, would you like to make a motion to amend the? Well, I think the, it should be to, to, uh, to approve all the extracurricular yes. ones, uh, as funded as set forth in our materials. Sure. Okay. Is that okay, Kathy? Do you want? Yep. To? Okay. Any other questions or comments? <clears throat> I had one other question. I know I'll be real busy my first one, but I'll calm down after a while. Okay. Um, having been through middle school sports with my son and found the vast majority of coaches to be excellent, but I found a couple to not be so excellent. Um, has, you, do you have any experience with Mr. O'Rourke, and is he well considered and well liked by the students? Can I actually answer that? Because I have a lot of experience. Well, go right ahead. <laughs> my son has been coached by... Um, Jim O'Rourke for um, the last three or four years, my youngest son. He's an excellent coach, excellent role model, wonderful father um, and community member and has volunteered um, at this capacity for two of his kids' teams for I think the last four or five years. So, I've That's good enough for me. <laughs> okay. Any other questions or comments? Okay. All those in favor? Thank you, Jeff. Good luck with the good. Yeah. Thank you, Jeff. Okay. So moving back now to communications, uh, wellness activities. I believe Elaine Brissag. Hi. Um, good evening. Thanks for a few minutes uh, to allow me to speak on behalf of the wellness committee and talk about some of the initiatives and um, exciting things we're doing around wellness. My name is Elaine Broussard. I'm an instructional support teacher at the high school, but I also coordinate the high school health committee. And we have two other coordinators, Paula Harris from Pond Cove and Gretchen McCloy from 
the middle school, um, I was really glad to hear from the students over there about some of the improved nutritional aspects of the cafeteria, so that's great. Um, something we've been working very hard with um, and for. But our committee goals are really to bring awareness to the school community, students and staff alike, on not just nutrition, but also, also physical activity and comprehensive wellness. Um, and as you know, with rising health care costs that we're all facing, one of our goals this year in terms of a committee is to um, really promote uh, improved health care and improved um, health lifestyles for our staff who work, work here in Cape Schools as one way to help manage um, health care costs. And it's a long-term commitment we're making on behalf of, of staff um, for our committee. Um, We've had a, a great deal of success with the committee, and as you probably know, and those of you that are new to the school board, the vast majority of our um, funding comes from grants as well as community support. We've received over um, $10,000 of Let's Go funds for, for K through 12 programming over three years. Let's Go is a local initiative that helps promote um, health awareness to educational communities. And we also received some, um, a large CEF impact grant um, that was over $16,000 for the high school cafeteria renovation project as well as our um, Chef of the Month program, which continues. And uh, Gretchen McCloy got a CEF grant this year and um, we've also received some other funding through the parent associations. Um, this year, our commitment, as I mentioned, has really been to some staff initiatives, uh, a real focus point that we've, that we've had this year, something that I applied for, for funds from Let's Go. So we received over $500 to, to just address uh, staff health care and promote wellness activities. Um, we had a great start. We had a week of wellness events for staff at the beginning of the year. Let's Go came and presented here in our September school board meeting. Um, and we've had a great deal of support from Community Services and Janet Hoskin, as well as our um, um, nutritional director, Peter Esposito, in helping us promote nutritional and, and active um, activities. This year, for 2010, we've actually created as a committee um, a, a list of monthly themes that we want to work on with staff. And today we had our first activity January, the theme being on um, healthy lifestyles, fitness, and weight loss. And today we had a health fair, actually, over at Community Services. Um, it was quite su successful. We had over 40 employees show up. Um, over 20 employees signed up for a weight loss program that will continue throughout the year. And we had two physicians that donated their time from the community um, to come in and do some health care screenings. And our nurses provided vision hearing, body mass, um, you name it, we were doing it over there. So. Um, but it was, a great, it was well attended, and it was something we hope to do annually. And um, some other monthly themes that we have include lifelong sports and healthy heart cooking, um, stress management, and some social activities that we hope to do to promote camaraderie and a sense of community among our K-12 staff. Um, in addition, we've got the Chef of the Month program, We've got middle school activities going on, as well as elementary, to service our kids and our goal is to be role models for them as well. Uh, and I just want to welcome Kate uh, Hewitt as our new uh, board member representative to the K-12 Wellness Committee. So if there's anything else you'd like to say. It's, it's very impressive. Um, each meeting I've been at, there's been 10 to 15, the first meeting. Uh, more, above 15, I guess, is the number of people who attend the wellness meetings. And the, each week um, on Tuesdays, the, t the group is doing activities, like sledding is next Tuesday. And so it just increases the K-12 to um, community. It's very nice. And I just want to mention, too, we have a website that will be up and running for the School Wellness Committee, um, and that is being 
um, created now by some community volunteers, and we have input from Hope and from other local um, listings that will be featured on that website. So that should be up and running soon. Thank you. Thank you. I'm right. Sorry, Elaine. Again, uh, uh, I have a question. I'm particularly concerned with uh, stress levels in high school. And do you have specific programs that deal with stress of, of children in high school? I think we have support systems that will, that will address stress management issues. Um, it's always a growing concern across, you know, as we're facing more difficult times, I think we see more um, elevated levels of, of stress that impacts students and staff. Um, we have um, a natural helpers program that assists students. We've got some supports within school. Um, in terms of specific stress management programs, that may be a great opportunity for the wellness committee when we have student representatives to talk about ways that we can address uh, If I may, I, I would, would suggest that because a lot of what you've talked about, uh, the kid has to recognize that he has stress and then he has to go to it. I, I think it would be really helpful if you were more of an advocate to explain to people and had programs where they could learn to, that stress management techniques are not tough but you have to learn them, you have to practice them. And um, I, I find just from being over there all the time and um, that there is a great deal of stress and I would ask the wellness community to consider being more proactive in that regard and, and more um, sort of, a, you know, setting up programs where kids can come in and not feel subconscious and learn the eight steps of um, stress, de-stressing and yeah. so forth. And the other thing I want to tell you that uh, being the chairman of the Health Insurance Committee, um, depending on what insurance program we have, there is a lot of funding and a lot of help that an insurance company will give to a community. Like you're talking about a lot of your local fundings. Well, our wellness committee and my firm is heavily funded. We have data programs, we have computer programs, we have a phenomenal system. And through that, we're able to partially uh, cut back on our insurance costs, at the same time take advantage of the free resources that the insurance company gives. Right. So you might want to talk with the union representatives or, or whomever you deal with on the insurance companies. They do have programs that are free. They volunteer time of nurses and all kinds of things. It's, it's a phenomenal program that they will do for supplement what you do. Yeah, and I, I think, David, we're trying to um, also make that connection with Anthem and create some more dialogue and communication about how we can work together to they're, service. They're, they're very proactive, and I, I'm not, not, I don't know Anthem as well as yeah. our insurance company. I know that they're very proactive because the, the studies come back that um, it's astronomical when you're proactive how much it decreases uh, usage of um, care providers. There's actually a great article that I brought um, as a reference point for me, but it's about a gentleman in here in town, um, Don Hodge, who owns Hannaford um, Food Markets, and he's in Cape Elizabeth, but he's featured in Maine Ahead, and he speaks highly about the need for wellness programs to defray health care costs, and how they've been such a successful model of that in the Hannaford Company. So just some information and models that we can use. And, and I would suggest take a look at him because it's been very successful as far as I know in my law firm and other firms. Yeah, great. Thank you. Okay, next is uh, Modern Language Learning Goals. Good evening. Angela Schapani, the representative for Modern Languages. And what I have for you this evening is an overview and the rationale of our priority and secondary learning goals that you received at the last teaching and learning committee. And it was that large, overview, large document that looked like that. And I hope you don't mind if I read so that I get all of my points in place. <coughs> the learning goals that you do have before you for approval have been the goals of the language program since the inception of the elementary program 24 years ago. At that time, after months of research and planning, it was determined that indeed the primary focus of any language program should be communication. As the American Council on the Teaching of Foreign Languages asserts in their standards for foreign language learning, language and communication are at the heart of the human experience. 
The United States must educate students who are linguistically and culturally equipped to communicate successfully in a pluralistic American society and abroad. For this reason, starting in grade three and through level six in the high school, the focus priority learning goal is communication with the end goal of fluency in a second language. When we reference communication, we are really alluding to all modes of communication, which is speaking, listening, reading, and writing. And though all of these modes are addressed in our classrooms, the actual speaking of the language is given the highest priority. In grades three through six, communication is the only priority goal listed as we build a level of comfort with the language. Starting in grade seven, we recognize that as language needs become more complex, it is important to understand the structural and grammatical workings of the language. At this time, we add the structural and grammatical understanding to our priority goals, but only as a support to communication, never to supplant it. Gone really are the days of copious and tedious translations in favor of a more communicatively active classroom. In terms of our secondary language goals, they really serve to support and strengthen the priority language goals. In grades three through eight, our secondary learning goals are culture, functional and situational vocabulary, and connections. Cultural understanding is an important learning goal as language evolves from culture, and to be able to truly communicate in a language, one needs to appreciate and understand the cultural underpinnings of that language. Vocabulary development is an obvious learning goal if we want our students' language abilities to advance so that they're able to speak about a variety of topics. And finally, through connections, students are able to see how language can cross any content barriers and that we can use language to practice core skills and to also learn content information. The connections piece in grades three through eight also has a historical background. 24 years ago, when the decision was made to begin the elementary program, the language teachers recognized that in order to do this, content teachers would need to give up some of their time to the language classes. And to recognize and, and acknowledge and honor that sacrifice, the elementary and middle school teachers promised to connect language learning to <coughs> other content areas as much as they possibly could. And this promise still holds true, as evidenced by the inclusion of this area in the document. Like the language program in grades three through eight, high school secondary learning goals also include culture and functional and situational vocabulary. However, at the high school level, connections is not specifically included in the learning goals document, though many content area topics are studied <coughs> in language classes, such as topics around science and nature, art, historical events, and elements of literature. In the place of connections at the high school level, we have the introducing structure section in order to create a spiraling effect of grammar content, which we recognize is often a challenge for students when they are learning a language. So in a nutshell, when we consider the priority and secondary goals, our secondary <coughs> language goals are the manner in which the primary language goal of communication is introduced and also practiced. Uh, and what you see in the document of priority and secondary <coughs> language goals is really our endeavor to have our students be true communicators in a second or perhaps third language through knowing how, when, and why to say what to whom. I would also like to, to stress that though I have highlighted the longevity of these goals and our program, our program is by no means static. Uh, it is a 24-year work in progress. We're continually reflecting on our practice. We are continually measuring ourselves to that original vision that we had 24 years ago. 
We're continually asking ourselves questions. Are we doing what we need to do so that all students have the opportunity to be comfortable <coughs> in a second language? So in conclusion, we're appreciative of the opportunity to share with you what we do as um, we are very proud of our program. And we're looking forward to sharing more about our program with the board at the January 26th Teaching and Learning Workshop. And we also do invite any board members to visit our classrooms to see in person um, an active communicative language learning process. And I will say, I, should have, I was going to say this ahead of time, but I did include myself as part of this, as I still consider myself part of that. And I'm lucky enough that they are also willing to, to keep me on board. Um, so I want to thank you. And if there are any questions on the document, I'll do my best to try and answer those. I would mention uh, first uh, a mistake we made in building the agenda for tonight. We didn't put down a vote on this for this evening. So what we think would probably be the best route is we thank you for your report. And then on, in two weeks, we'll also take a vote on that at the same time. Okay. I would encourage the board, however, if they, um, and I hope that they did study the, the document, if they have questions or comments that they'd like to make to do that tonight. So perhaps Angela does not have to come back in two weeks. <laughs> Angela, I have a yeah. question. Um, mm -hmm. hi. Will you tell me, each student in Pond Cove, it's a mandatory, it's part of our curriculum? It is. However, I wouldn't say it's each and every. We do have students who have been exempted uh, due to IEP because they're having challenges in other areas. Mm -hmm. So the, I couldn't give you a percentage, no, no, but the okay. majority is, it is definitely well, part I of Well, I guess that I, that's what I wanted to ask. So in, um, that's in the IEP process, mm -hmm. so that is handled with Dom. Mm -hmm. And then the same for middle school, mm -hmm. um, and every child has an IEP who, um, that's a relationship between you, the language teacher, and the parents to decide if a child is, doesn't have an IEP but may not, um, may struggle in a language. Is there room, has this conversation ever come up? In, in, no, uh, um, I, not that I'm aware of. Okay. The students, it's part of the curriculum, just like history, just like science, just like ELA. So it is part of the curriculum unless there's, there's a specified reason through the IEP process that they are not taking the language, but every other child is. And then the next question is in... Could you pull down your... Oh, sorry. Okay, thank you. Still a little afraid of this. Okay. <laughs> and then the next okay. piece is um, in high school, mm -hmm. we always take national exams to decide where the placement is for students. Is it a nationally based exam or is nope, it a... The, nope. The eighth grade exam that uh, eighth graders take is actually a, a, a locally developed. Um, we've had it in place for numerous years. It has been revised and updated and looked at to see if it's still measuring what we, we want it to measure. I would say it is, it is extremely accurate um, when we have the incoming ninth graders, we might need to juggle around a few placements, but for the most part we do, through that uh, placement exam, have students pretty well placed. It's in September so that they're not losing time. Mm -hmm. um, when you're making switches, sometimes it can get challenging, it might take a little bit of time, and then it might also involve moving other things in their schedule. Right. So we really do try, want to avoid that process. This past year, a handful, and I think that's probably the norm. We might have a handful, but for the most part, the, the assessment um, is, is very accurate in terms of placement. Thank you. Yep. Any other questions? Um, no, I would just add um, as a comment to the board that Angela will be at our Friday Teaching and Learning Committee meeting at 1 o'clock um, in Alan's office. So if, if you are thinking about this and want to go over the handout um, between now and then and have additional questions, um, Angela will be there to answer mm -hmm. those questions yeah, as well. Um, I didn't get a handout. Comes up. You, you got a handout at the last workshop. Oh, I'm sorry. That's where Angela 
Um, I had one quick question, um, but I could also do it at teaching and learning if we want to move this along mm -hmm. on Friday. No, I, if you got, go ahead and ask okay, I, I'm just curious because again, I'm, uh, I don't have a lot. Of, I didn't bring that material with me. Um, is one of the goals? I, I've always been curious. We we have uh, honors programs in almost every uh, discipline in the high school, but we don't have one for languages. Yes. Well, it's it's done a little bit differently. Uh, it it is actually done by level. Um, once they achieve a certain level, it's now considered honors and is given honors credit. So on the French side, we have um, level four and level five are given honors credit, and then level five or six, because then five and six are AP, it gets a little complicated. On the Spanish side, uh, because we do have the, the two um, tracks, we have the conversation track and we have the literature track starting at level four. The literature track is the honors at level four and its CP is the conversation. At level five, both are honors. So it, it's not, it, it's by the level that they achieve that honors credit is given. Okay, so that means Because we just don't actually have the numbers to really split as you would do in ELA, where you have the, all of the students are taking ELA, so you have the, the pool of students that you can split into the various levels. So we're, we do it a little bit differently. Okay, I'm a bit confused. It's confusing. Okay, well, then I guess I'm justifiably confused. If I'm simply talking about honors versus CP versus, uh, mm -hmm. if assume we have the numbers taken languages that we can have an honors program and a CP program and uh, my question originally was is, is that an attempt to to gravitate towards that or why do we not have an honors program for for Spanish and we have or, or French until you get to a very high level whereas we do it in most other major disciplines mm -hmm. and is there a design personally I think that there would be uh, there, are, there are kids just like in any in the other discipline who do really well in languages, yet they don't get mm -hmm. honors credit. And as we all know, honors, you know, colleges count honors programs, and we have levels. And so we have to explain to, like I know Yarmouth has an honors program, for example, for their languages. I know a few other schools do. And I'm questioning whether or not this is a goal for the learning goals to create a, an honors program. Okay. And if not, why not? Yeah. I can't see from the the side of my head. That's okay. Um, I think that was a question that um, we had sent to Angela early on, um, like a month ago. Is it possible to? Yeah, it wasn't one of the questions. I mean, we can add it to the list of questions. Can we add that to the list questions. and we can discuss it in the committee meeting? Is that okay, David? That's fine. I just, it's okay. something that I've always noticed, and that's why I asked whether it should yeah. be now to the committee. But I, as long as I can get it answered, and I, I, I think it's a ripe area for us to improve upon. I think I remember it because I think we talked about it at the committee, the last committee meeting, but maybe it never got sent got to Angela. Got the, the yeah. questions. Because I remember you. David, could I just clarify, are you asking in terms of at all levels? Yes. So at level two, why do we not have a CP honors all level. level three, all levels? Yes. Okay. Any other questions, comments? Okay. Thank you very much, Angela. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Angela. Um, I, I think if it's okay with the board, I would like to suggest that we move up 7A before the ad hoc curtailment committee report because that's going to be quite lengthy and I really don't want to keep Mary here um, super late. So is it okay with the board if we move that up? Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so uh, next is 7A, consideration to approve Cape Elizabeth Schools Teacher Certification Renewal Plan as revised in November 2009. And if I could just make a, a couple of comments before we start. Uh, the, uh, Mary presented the program, I think it was in the December meeting, and one of the things that uh, many people have asked me about is the process of how this occurred, why it isn't done by the state, et cetera. So Mary and I have had a, a good conversation about this. and. 
actually the timeline goes back even further than I thought it did. So Aunt Mary's going to spend a few minutes talking about the timeline and then also talking about what they do in this process for certifying teachers where I look at it as their license to teach and therefore what they must do in the process. Mary, thank you very much for coming to do that. Thank you. Um, when I first started getting this material together, I put together a PowerPoint presentation and I said, no, that's going to take too long and it will be it really won't serve the purpose. So some of these handouts that I've given you are from my original PowerPoint presentation, but I decided it would be more effective just to give it to you orally and have you have a, excuse me, a written copy of it. I have a few extras if you like the audience would like to know. If at any point during this presentation I'm not addressing the questions that you have, feel free to tell me and I'll stop and answer any questions that you do have. My understanding from my discussion with Alan is you wanted to understand how the way we do certification renewal now is different from the way it was when it was done directly through the State Department. That takes us all the way back to 1985 when the law was passed. Uh, what has changed recently, and the reason why you're asked to approve a new plan, is not a change in the law. It's a change in the rules and regulations that govern how the law is implemented. So I'll get to that as we go along. But uh, to start out with, I think all of you have a copy of the uh, proposed renewal, uh, new plan, and we'll get to that later. But right now, if you look at the materials that I just passed out to you, uh, if we go back to prior to 1985 when the current law was put into effect, uh, there were two levels of teacher certification. The first one was provisional, and that was a certificate that teachers got when they graduated from uh, college with their bachelor's degree and started teaching. They were given a provisional certificate, which was a five-year certificate. And to renew that certificate every five years, they were required to take six college credits, and when they successfully did that, they sent the transcript to the directly to the state with their renewal application, and the certificate was renewed. There was no requirement about what the courses had to be. It could be any courses. There were lots of people who had an interest in real estate. They'd take real estate courses so they could be a real estate agent on the side. The courses they took had, did not have to have anything to do with education. They just had to be college courses. Uh, the other level of certification that teachers had back before 1985 was a professional certificate, which was a 10-year certificate. And in order to have that, you had to have a master's degree in education. And to renew that certificate again, all that was required was six college credits, or two courses every, uh, in this case, every 10 years. So that's really not a whole lot of education. And again, it didn't have to have anything to do with the certificate you were renewing. It just had to be two college courses. Uh, for instance, back then when I renewed my certificate, a lot of us, when we were uh, deciding what course to take, it was decided more or less on what night was most convenient to go and what course was being offered that night that you might be interested in. Uh, one time I had to renew mine, and I had, uh, I had one more course to take. Uh, a certain night of the week was the most convenient for me to go because my husband was teaching at the university. It was a lot more convenient for me to ride in when he went. So there was no course that really interested me particularly that had to do with what I was teaching. So my husband looked down through the list of courses and he said, oh, here's a course in probability statistics. You can't pass that. I said, oh, yes, I can. So that's what I taught. It had nothing to do with what I was teaching. <laughs> but it was a course that was available when I took it. Uh, all of that background is uh, to try to help you understand why the changes were made in the, in the law. Uh, since 1985, the renewal process, initial certification still goes directly through the state, but certification renewal has been put on the local level. It's supervised locally, and the renewal activities have to be related to the certificate that you're renewing. And the inexperienced teachers, the teachers who have their initial certificate, are offered uh, assistance by an experienced teacher. 
and the local committee makes the renewal recommendations to the state. So there's a lot more input on the local level and uh, by the teachers themselves into their renewal process. And the major emphasis of this was to try to make the renewal more meaningful to the teachers and more meaningful to the students that they teach so that it really has a direct relationship. And as I said earlier, the changes that have been made recently, after 20 years, they felt that it was really time to, to look at the rules and regulations that are part of Chapter 115, which regulate the renewal process for certification. So that's what has changed recently. And actually, the changes in the uh, certification renewal plan that, I, uh, that was presented to you at the December meeting are really not that drastically different from the uh, plan that was approved initially back in the early 1990s. After the law was uh, put into place, they had a period of time where they had pilot sites around the state to uh, implement the law and determine these rules and regulations before it was implemented statewide. And Cape Elizabeth was fortunate enough to be one of the 15 communities around the state that was a pilot site. And I was fortunate enough to be the liaison between Cape Elizabeth and the state and go to all those meetings and be, uh, represent Cape Elizabeth as a pilot site. So you can see my history with this uh, law and with the rules and regulations that govern it goes back to the very beginning. Um, so uh, I prepared this little chart, which is uh, the fourth page in the little packet that I gave you of all the levels of certificate that uh, are available to teachers. I don't know if you want me to take the time to go through all of them, but I think it's important. I know one of the things that you're probably concerned about is the mentor uh, responsibility that we have to provide mentors for teachers who are inexperienced. And if you'll notice on this chart, the certificate holders that require having mentors work with them are the conditional certificate holders. A uh, conditional certificate is issued only to teachers who do not meet all the entry level requirements. They're missing some of the professional requirements, the, the actual teaching courses that you're required to take to be able to be eligible for full certification. When uh, a person comes and wants to be a teacher and they're missing some of those, uh, some of those requirements, uh, they're eligible for a conditional certificate. And that certificate can only be issued if the employing superintendent uh, files an affidavit. And when that person is hired, uh, a mentor is assigned to that person to work with them so that a, um, an experienced teacher who's had special training in mentoring can work with that teacher and try to help them gain the professional knowledge they need more quickly than they would if they're left on their own. Going back again to before 1985, when I started teaching, I started with a provisional certificate. I never had a conditional certificate. But when I started teaching, I was given a classroom and some textbooks and put into a room. And I was pretty much on my own to figure out what on earth I was supposed to do with these 25 students in these textbooks. Uh, our purpose in uh, providing mentors for the new teachers is to give them an experienced teacher who works closely with them to try to help them uh, bridge that gap from being the new person that is really floundering to a more professional person more quickly and doing that by support of a, a person who has experience. So a conditional certificate and also the, the last three on this list, the waiver, the tar targeted needs, and the transitional endorsement. Uh, the waiver, the targeted need, and the conditional certificate are for all for people who don't meet entry level requirements. A transitional endorsement is for a person who meets entry level requirements in one area but is teaching in a different area. So all of those people are required to work with a mentor. Um, 
Initially, in the, in the first plan that we had, all of the teachers in those categories were required to work with the um, uh, support team that was made up of three people. So actually, this new plan that we're asking you to uh, approve now, actually, we have uh, less requirements for paying mentors because we only have one person working with each new person now instead of three. For the last probably eight or nine years, we've had to request annually to the State Department to allow us to use mentors instead of support teams. And with this change in the laws, now it's the state requirement that it's just a mentor instead of a three-person support team. So that's actually a saving to the local district. Um, the uh, conditional, the waiver, the targeted need, and the transitional endorsements are all one-year certificates that have to be renewed annually. Each one of those can be renewed up to twice so that you can have three of them. So they expect that you meet all of the entry-level requirements within that three-year period. And under the old rules and regulations, it was five years. So they've decreased the amount of time that they allow teachers to meet that uh, entry-level requirement. So that's another change from the initial plan that we offered. Um, the next sheet in your pack that I gave you are the steps in gaining professional level certification. And the first step is that the state issues a certificate to the person, um, either a conditional certificate, a targeted needs certificate, or a provisional certificate. And then a mentor is assigned to meet with that certification candidate. The mentor and candidate meet on a regular basis. The candidate completes the self-assessment. The mentor completes one classroom observation cycle. And what an observation cycle is, is a pre-conference before the observation where uh, the mentor goes over what is going to be taught while they're in the room observing, trying to help the teacher understand better and prepare better for the class. The actual observation of the class and then a post-conference after the observation to discuss uh, whether or not the class went the way that the teacher thought it would, what was different, what they'd do differently if they had to teach the class again. So that they're getting a uh, benefit of um, discussing that class with an experienced teacher. And then the mentor and the candidate meet together to, to develop a teacher action plan. What the teacher is going to do over the one year or two year period to enhance their teaching ability to be able to teach better for the students that are in their class. And then the candidate and the teacher uh, develop the TAP in the portfolio. And at the end of the first year, they review that TAP, make any uh, revisions that are necessary, submit that. Well, initially, they submitted the TAP for approval to the committee. At the end of the first year, any revisions they have to send back to the committee for approval once again. And then the candidate and the uh, mentor continue working the second year, complete the TAP, submit the TAP and all the documentation to the committee to show that they have completed the TAP and hopefully are eligible for prof professional certification. And I've given you a sample TAP at the end of your packet, along with the, there are 10 state standards that the TAP has to be developed around. And I've given you a list of those 10 standards as well. And you'll notice if you flip to the back of your packet to the sample TAP, there's a lot more that a new teacher is required to do uh, to develop this teacher action plan and complete it than just to run off to the university and take two courses that may be meaningful and may not be. Uh, this, there's a lot of thought that goes into this. Uh, the teacher does a self-assessment uh, using these 10 standards. The uh, mentor does an observation, and they sit down together and talk about how best that teacher can uh, focus their activity for certification renewal to meet the needs of their students and to uh, grow professionally. Um, Mary, could I just add one thing to that, just so that <clears throat> there's no confusion here, is that the difference between the mentor work with a new teacher 
and the work that the administrators do to evaluate the teacher, those are two different processes. Mm -hmm. The mentor work that they do them does not become something that we can use for hiring, firing. It is the work of the administrator that does that piece to it. So I just want to be sure you're understanding there is a difference between those two components of the plan. And, and that's emphasized. We do special training for people who are going to be mentors. Uh, Angela went through that training, and I think she will attest to the fact that it's emphasized in that training that you're there to support the teacher, not to evaluate the teacher. Um, and the teacher is made to feel that that is your role and that they can bear their soul to you. If I were a brand new teacher and my admin the administrator <coughs> who was in charge of hiring and firing me were in my room, I wouldn't tell them the same things that I would tell my mentor because I would be afraid that if I told them something that they might not like, maybe they wouldn't want to hire me back. But the mentor is there to allow you to tell, to share your deepest, darkest dreads, secrets, whatever, and help you get through those to get uh, to a point of feeling uh, like a confident teacher. Um, going back here, uh, the teeth uh, to the sheet that's entitled uh, teacher responsibilities for conditional and provisional certificate holders. What are the expectations that we have for those teachers? Um, they have to complete all the main requirements um, in a timely manner. So if they have a conditional certificate or a transitional endorsement or any of those that are not full certifications, they have to do the coursework or the test or whatever it is that the state says that they have to do to meet the minimum entry level requirements as a teacher. Uh, they have to meet regularly with the mentor. They have to complete the self-assessment and develop their teacher action plan. They have to complete the teacher action plan and collect artifacts uh, for a portfolio for documentation of completion of those um, activities. And they have to provide the portfolio documentation to the committee at the end of the period of time to show that they have indeed completed all of what they said they would do in their TAP that was, con that was approved by the committee back at the beginning of the process. And the teacher responsibilities for a professional certificate holder, the, the person who has a five-year certificate, they have to also look at the 10 state standards, do a self-assessment to determine what they need to focus their professional growth on and uh, develop goals for their renewal plan, their professional renewal plan. Then they have to develop a professional renewal plan containing 90 contact hours of approved study or work during the five-year period of their certification. Then they have to document the pre-approved 90 contact hours within that five-year period and submit documentation at the end that they have completed all of that work. And then uh, the next sheet, and the last one that we haven't gone over, is expectations and if you look at that sheet you'll see that there is a lot that a mentor does to help that new teacher and I won't take the time or bore you by reading all of this sheet but just glancing down through it and skimming it you can see that there are lots of things if you were a brand new teacher if someone who had experience would sit down and go through with you at the either before school starts or at the very beginning of school, a lot of these things that when I started teaching and when Alan started teaching and a lot of the people who were here started teaching, you had to figure those things out by yourself. And sometimes it took a long time to figure them out. Um, and then after that first initial period, the uh, ongoing throughout the period of the mentoring these are all supportive things that the, that the mentor is asked to do for the teacher that they're mentoring. Now, I hope that gives you a little bit of background about how this is different from how certification was before this law was passed and um, some of the changes that have been put into this plan that we're asking you to approve. Um, as I said, there aren't that many differences between this plan and the one that was approved 
back in the early 90s. Uh, some of the things that are different, I already told you, uh, we now have mentors instead of support teams. Um, we only have uh, three years to work with people on conditional uh, certificates or uh, target need certificates. Those people who are not, don't, don't meet the entry level requirements, we only have three years to work with them now instead of five. Um, and then there are some other minor changes. Um, so if you have any questions, I know you've probably, a lot of you have had a chance to look through the plan and may have some questions about it. I'd be happy to try to answer any of them for you. I hope I didn't take too much time. I apologize if I did. Does the board have any questions? I do have a question. Okay. And I'm not sure if it's for you, Mary. Um, it's very I'll be happy to try to answer it if I, if I don't think it's my <clears throat> area to, of expertise, and I'll refer it to whomever I think Thank I you. should. Um, and please... It, uh, in, you know, interrupt me if this is a, an, a better time, uh, if there's another better time. I'm wondering, I went through this process in 1986 when I moved to Maine from Massachusetts mm -hmm. and started teaching at the Spurring School and had a mentor. For my, um, it was so helpful to have, I had Susan McPherson, I don't know if you recognize her, um, as my mentor. It was wonderful. Looking back at it, of course, 20 years later, <clears throat> is it 20 years, 10 years? I am wondering, it was so helpful to teach and get to have my mentor that I'm wondering where finances are difficult, can we have new teachers proposed for in the budget? Have a, um, the new teach out of the new teacher salary pay for the mentor stipend rather than the school board? Or is this, should this be discussed at a, um, the uh, relations, you know, uh, what's that other committee? The finance. Finance, and then there's another one with, with human high. Human resources. Yeah, human resources. Human resources yeah. Being that it, yeah. it's so important to get good teachers, and I would never want to discourage any person who wanted to teach for make it harder for a person to, a person wants to teach to teach, but where budget is so difficult. Yeah, I think that that's a question possibly for, for a finance committee meeting or when we talk, talk about the budget. Great. Um, and maybe uh, if it goes beyond that to the human resources committee. But mm -hmm. I think for this evening, we're just simply reviewing the certification mm -hmm. plan um, and process. You'll notice that in the plan itself, there's no mention of any fees or, or that's the plan itself and the state law doesn't address anything about paying mentors. It says that you have to have mentors. Yes. Uh, the amount that you pay mentors or how you pay them is all a part of the, the local, however you decide right. you want to do it. If it's between the teachers and the school board, then it's part of the negotiations plan. If it's something else, then it would be part of the finance committee or whatever committee. Mary? Um, I have a couple of questions. Okay. Um, the, the first is, how many um, mentors do we currently have out there, mentoring teachers? This year, I didn't count them. Let me do, you can give me a I would say we have probably eight or nine this year. Eight or nine. And the stipend is usually close to? The stipend, I believe, is... Um, $1,400. Okay. Um, so um, you also mentioned that there was a cost savings moving to mentors away from teams. Um, at, about how much did you save, Mary? Do you know? Well, actually, we've been using mentors ourselves mm -hmm. here in Cape Elizabeth for mm -hmm. the past eight or ten years, but we had to request that from the state get an exemption from using the support teams okay. annually. But we've been using mentors for a while now, so mm -hmm. there's actually no cost saving this particular year. Um, I think the number of mentors that we've had over the last few years has been declining because we've had fewer and fewer newer teachers. Right. Yeah. So that would be a cost saving. Uh, I would imagine with the budget the way it is, we won't be having a lot of new teachers next year, so yeah. <laughs> we probably won't be having as many mentors next year because the number of the people who have mentors this year are on a second year. Okay. So they won't be having a mentor again next year. Okay. 
Um, and I'm, have you thought of streamlining any of these expectations? When I look at these expectations um, for a mentor to um, review with their new mentee, um, it seems like you might be able to do those in an orientation. Is that something that you could do to streamline it to maybe reduce costs? Well, I, I believe that they do try to cover a lot of those things in orientation, but when I don't know if you've ever been a teacher, but if no. you're a teacher and you go through those first days of all that orientation, you get so much thrown at you. Mm -hmm. The amount that you remember is not necessarily 100%. I can imagine. You know, you'd be 50%. Uh, and that the meeting where the teacher goes, the mentor goes through this with a new teacher, it looks like a, a lot of material that they go through, but it doesn't necessarily take all that much time because okay. it can be done a little bit here, a little bit there. Okay. Uh, and on a one-to-one -one basis, and when the teacher needs the information, they ask for it, and they know who to go to to ask, mm -hmm. it's a lot easier than trying to absorb it all at once at a, at a meeting with however many people that are in the meeting at one time. But mm -hmm. certainly that's something that could, usually it's done both ways but I think they probably remember more, more of it when the mentor goes through it with them. Okay. Thank you. I think if I could just add to that quickly, for some of us who've been around for 100 years or more teaching, uh, the re expectations of teachers have changed so greatly. I would say in the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. And so that list gets longer and longer and longer as far as expectations are concerned. And I think Angela would speak to her from the perspective of as a mentor, you revisited those on and off throughout the year as questions came up. I noticed NWEA was on there, and you would revisit it mm -hmm. as the time came along to do that. Yeah. And even though they're list, right? Even though they're listed all together, you do them as it comes up and it, as meaningful to the teacher. Mm -hmm. Rather than okay. just bombarding I, I see. all the things. Mm -hmm. So it's not a checklist per se. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Dave? Well, I'm still learning. Um, the entity that, that, that's in here that reviews um, uh, the PLCSS. Uh, the certification committee is what we call it, but the state asks us to call it the. Well, I, I prefer a certification committee. It's a lot easier to remember. Uh, so that's what I was going to ask. Mm -hmm. Is it the one that is that the entity that will grant the provisional or the or is it they make recommendations to the state? They the make state. recommendations to the state as far as renewing the certificate. So to a certain extent, what we're doing is the work what the state used to do, but we're doing it at the local level. Absolutely. So another unfunded mandate, so to speak. Yes, that's true. Um, the question, I, I've heard this before, and I've never believed it, but all our teachers in our school system are certified, whether it's provisional, conditional, whatever, and the goal is to make them all have a professional certificate. The only reason why somebody has less is they've just come out of college or they're transferring from one state to another, and they have to, uh, you know, or they're transferring from one school to another, and you want to make sure that they're familiar with your school system, they have a two-year period that they have to prove themselves. Um, so there's clearly a need for these different levels of certificates. Now, um, but I want to make it clear that all our teachers have one of these certificates, uh, and within a fairly short period of time we'll have the gold standard, the professional certificate. Our goal is to have all of them have it within a year, a couple of years. Yeah. Okay. Can I just add to that? Speaking of superintendent, they better have a certificate. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> because they if they don't, I'm in trouble. <laughs> well, I, I did, it's funny, you hear in all these emails and all these town calls, there's people that say that we have uncertified teachers, and I'm thinking to myself, that can't possibly be true. Nope, so just thinking of educating in the public, and that's what this, this system does. Um, we certainly try to uh, make sure that all of the teachers we hire are uh, certified uh, because if they're not, if we employ uncertified teachers, then the superintendent could lose his certificate. And well, we don't I, want that to happen. I understand the obvious, but sometimes you have to state the obvious for people to learn the obvious. Right. Um, the other question I have is, I'm a little 
I understand the need to have the mentor be delinked uh, and not be the greater of the person. But on the other hand, I know principals and assistant principals don't have a lot of time to evaluate teachers and go to a classroom and so forth. Is there, any, is there anything in this program, any, any thought being given to, I mean, these, these mentoring in this program do a lot of work that supplements what the principals and assistant principals have to do or the administration to evaluate a teacher. Is there any way to cross-pollinate to get some of the information from that so the principal can make a better decision? Or do you feel that on balance it's better to have this mentor be seen as a, um, a not a grader but merely a mentor? It's, very, it's imperative that they be seen by the teacher as a mentor. Uh, we certainly encourage the administrators to communicate with the mentors if they see areas that they're concerned about and that they feel the teacher's weak in. If the uh, administrator communicates that to the mentor and the teacher, either one or both, then certainly the mentor and the teacher can work on that area and try to strengthen it. So there is, that's good to know. So there is a way for the, the principal's assistant principals to notice something and say, rather than have me follow up on it, would you please follow up on it? So there is some overlap and workload. Absolutely. But we, we uh, discourage, well, we tell the mentors that is not their place and they shouldn't be sharing information that is shared by the teacher with them in a confidential situation. It would be inappropriate for them to share it with anybody else. And there's no way to avoid a mentoring program because we're constantly having teachers either come up through the ranks of the new teachers or transferring from other schools. We have constantly have teachers retiring. So there's a constant need, it seems to me, for a mentoring program. If that, unless the teacher's highly experienced, we still have to have some mentoring to get them familiar. So this seems to me that there's always going to be some need for a mentoring program. For example, if we replace teachers that retire with younger teachers, that it saves us money even if we spent a thousand dollars for a mentor. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay. Any other uh, questions or comments? Um, I just have one um, um, comment to make, David, in response to your statement about this is another unfunded mandate. I, I would rather use the term underfunded um, because I do believe we receive some funding, minor, um, through the EPS formula, um, but we all know um, what percentage of our costs we typically get funded by the state. It's on the average of about 12 percent, and they don't even fully fund the cost of mentoring, so it's probably even less than that. But um, I'm a stack to get a postage stamp from the state. Okay. So. so, but I just wanted to clarify Thank that you. it's not an yes, unfunded, I it's know, underfunded. I was on the stakeholders group that worked on the changes to Chapter 115, and that was one of the things that we emphasized as people from the field, that the local districts needed some sort of support from the state, and they can't designate, at least it was the way it was explained to us as stakeholders, they can't designate funds for a specific area, but they can add funds to the general formula, and that's what they did. But with the way they've been cutting funds to education, uh, what little was funded is little. Little. Right. Littler. Littler. <laughs> Thank you. Do I have a motion um, for item 7A? I move that we approve the Cape Elizabeth School Teacher Certification Renewal Plan as revised in November of 2009. Is there a second? I'll second. second. Oh. <laughs> okay. Is there um, any discussion? Um, I'd just like to thank Mary for putting this together. It's quite an education. Um, so thank Everybody you. And thank, it, and it, no. and thank you for an extremely lucid um, speech. It was really yes, helped me you. quite a bit. Well, Anybody else? Okay. All those in favor? Six zero. Thank you, Mary. Thanks, Mary. Okay. Now we're going to go back to six C. Um, which is the ad hoc curtailment committee report. I am going to do my best to get through this, um, but there's a lot of information, so um, I, I beg for everybody's uh, patience. Um, 
back in December, the, the Ad Hoc Curtailment Committee met, um, and the members were the ta Town Council, Cape Elizabeth Education Foundation, the uh, Cape Elizabeth Education Association, I know there's more in there, but yeah. I can never remember. CEA. CEA. Um, met and we um, decided to have a public uh, workshop where we broke up into groups. Um, I believe that everybody was in attendance that evening and about 90 um, citizens um, showed up that evening. And um, we have been going through all of those wall um, sticky notes that were hanging up at the end of the evening, putting together the feedback that we got from the citizens. And I um, forwarded to the board, and it is posted on our website, um, a categorical breakdown of the um, suggestions made um, by the public. Uh, it's quite extensive. We, we asked them to provide suggestions for revenues for both the school and municipal side and for expenditures on both the school and, and um, municipal side. Uh, we, so again, we, we correlated this in terms of categories and then attempted to the best of our ability to um, review some of the suggestions and um, evaluate what we are currently doing um, and if there are any sort of legal parameters around what can be done in these particular areas. Um, so uh, as quickly as I can, on the revenue side for the schools, um, there was a number of suggestions around sponsorships by individuals and businesses, uh, uh, corporate sponsorships of uh, anything from um, school activities to buildings um, and um, educational programs. Um, I'm not too familiar with the legal requirements around this. I don't suspect that there are many that, that, that there, this is being done across the country. Um, so this is potentially a, a topic um, for the school board. Um, and I will say that all of these actually c can and will be a topic for the school board discussions as we move forward, whether or not I mention any sort of parameters or things that are being done. But I just think it's good for um, us to communicate to the public of uh, those areas that have been addressed um, in the past by the school district. Um, student parking fees came up quite a bit also, um, it's particularly at the high school, uh, increase it, <coughs> charge for it, et cetera. And um, we do currently charge $20 to uh, cover parking for four years of, of a student's attendance at the high school. Um, and the money is used for signage as necessary and um, uh, the, the decals that are used to signify that somebody has paid for parking and then for some teacher appreciation activities that uh, exist in the high school. There are approximately 240 spaces for student parking um, and I think at the moment there's roughly about 110 uh, parking permits that have been issued for student vehicles. Um, Ath increase athletic charges. Um, there were some comments to that. Um, well, actually, some said charge students for sports, and then others were uh, expanded. And um, so I would say that you know we do actually have in place uh, a high school athletic fees, which is $120 per student, which is roughly $43,000 a year that um, comes to the district. Um, and 15% of the high school athletic budget is funded by this money. Uh, on the middle school side, um, the district now, as a result of decisions that were made a couple of years ago, the district now only pays for middle school uh, coaching stipends. All other costs were transferred to the community services that are now paid by families, which is a yearly $40 administrative fee and $50 per sport. And this covers roughly 39,000 in athletic expenses. Um, in addition, there is a 25 refundable deposit for uniforms, so the uniforms are used over again and um, will be charged, families will be charged if those uniforms are not returned. Um, it's interesting to note that at this moment, um, we believe that we are the only district in the area that charges athletic fees. Um, 
so the other districts are now studying it. Um, we obviously got to this uh, point in time a lot earlier than other districts did. Um, but Falmouth is looking at it, um, but they're uh, actually looking at it in a different, slightly different way, and that is categorize, categorizing sports in a one to three range and charging fees accordingly. Um, MSDA 51 is thinking about it. Um, Scarborough actually did charge fees at one point, but they um, no, no longer are charging fees. Um, there is also discuss, uh, suggestions made around charging for all extracurricular activities. Um, no district, as far as we know, uh, charges um, students for extracurricular activities. Um, and it doesn't seem that anyone is even looking at it with the exception of Yarmouth. Um, another suggestion was the boosters, asking the boosters to participate and, and help fund um, at a higher level. I thought it would be good to um, share with the fact that um, in 07-08, uh, seven, seven, athletic boosters raised roughly $186,000, which was roughly 30% of our total athletic expenses. And in 08-09, they raised $178,000. Um, okay, sports sport ticket revenue. Um, there was a, several suggestions about um, getting revenue from ticket sales, and we actually do um, have gate fees for football, boys ice hockey, and boy girl basketball. Um, they're the only sports that we do collect at the gate, mostly because it's the o these are the only activities where we get um, a high level of um, turnout. Yes, David. They actually do charge uh, for track. I paid one for every track meet so far this year. Here, 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 here in Cape Elizabeth. No, all track meets for the high school that held it. Uh, um, University of Southern Maine. Yeah. And you pay a fee, which yeah. pays for the cost of the. Right. That's money that does not come to Cape Elizabeth. No, I understand that, but in right. terms of it's the savings that it's something the parents pay that's that, that the school doesn't have to pay. Yeah. Well, so um, I will continue to explain that um, for uh, playoff games like the footballs, the quarter, semi, and regional finals. Um, those are divided into third. The host and the opponents get a, a, a split, as does the Campbell Conference. The MPA collects the gate at the state championship game. So even if the state championship game were here, we would collect none of the receipts of that. Ice hockey playoff game, um, at the gate, the host team collects for the quarterfinal. And then at the regional and state championships, the gates are all collected by the MPA, which is the main principals association. And basketball playoffs are all held at an independent site, and the gate is collected by the main principals association, which is probably what you're experiencing at these tracks, uh, track meets. So um, we have limited flexibility on how much we actually can um, take in as a district for uh, gate receipts for our athletic um, events. Um, there was a great deal of uh, mentioning uh, charging for busing um, and charging for busing, because this is just revenue. Um, no district in the state of Maine currently charges for busing. Um, there are other states in the n nationally that do, but um, in Maine, nobody charges for busing at the moment. Um, and as far as I am aware, there is no law prohibiting the charging for busing. Um, but it, but you know, it's something that um, has not been done in the past by any district in Maine. Uh, there's discussion around tuition students, um, which is something that actually the school board has um, talked about in the past, and I know that uh, Alan is looking at that um, for the future. Um, asking other areas was donations, um, facility fees and charges, um, pool fees, field fees, rent out Hannaford Field, rent out buses. Um, there's some interesting ideas around renting out our classrooms to SMCC. Um, or collaborative programs with colleges to use our buildings. Uh, we, we do charge facility fees f um, for our buildings. Uh, it's controlled by the community services office and there are various levels of categories of how um, we charge for that. Uh, and we do charge for Hannaford Field and in the past year uh, $5,450 um, was generated from the rental of Hannaford Field. Um, other ideas? 5,450. 5, oh, yeah. I mean, sorry. It's okay. 
Uh, other ideas were offer adult education, um, our audit opportunities of high school classes. Um, state funding, there was a great deal of um, frustration expressed around the um, lack of balanced funding of ed public education in Cape Elizabeth by the state. And one term that I found entertaining was put on the gloves with the state. Um, I will just mention again that we have been up to Augusta for, on a number of occasions as board members, and Alan goes up there quite a bit. Um, there's a great deal of conversation about uh, making sure that we're getting um, what is owed under the EPS formula and the funding law, uh, but it is a uphill battle for sure. Um, the, on similar lines, there was a number of suggestions that the district privatize, and um, obviously uh, that issue would need to be assessed um, as to whether it would provide an actual financial savings to Cape Elizabeth citizens to do that because um, as of the moment we still are actually receiving state funding um, and we would have to analyze whether uh, the savings of going private would outweigh the, um, finan the financial support that we are getting from the state. And there possibly could be some legal um, obstacles that, that we would have to look at. Um, and then uh, taxes. The, the sentiments, there were, there were sentiments on both extremes. Um, on one extreme said, go ahead, raise our taxes as much as you need to support our education. Other uh, sentiment was don't raise our tax taxes at all. Um, and, but I would say that there was probably a greater um, number of comments that were more in the middle, which was that it needs to be a, a balanced approach, that there needs to be an effort to um, limit expenditures, and with that would come a limited um, support and increase in taxes. Um, let's see, and then we have other miscellaneous. There were some interesting ones, a lecture series, um, charge for our lecture series, and certainly we have some really wonderful um, events that are organized by our high school students that perhaps if we did a better job of um, promoting, we could maybe earn a little extra money, but um, summer school fees, uh, school cell branded affiliated products, um, charge for field trips. Uh, we, we actually um, do charge for field trips, but I'll address that in the expenditure area. Uh, cell seats in classes that we have that are under-enrolled to Scarborough and South Portland, et cetera. Again, a lot of these are on, on the website. Okay, now we're in the expenditure. <clears throat> Can I make one or two comments on real quickly? Real I, quickly, please. I read the large and then I read the small, and um, this is a summary. I, I noticed one that summary was, and I assume it's meant to be this way, it's only school comments, not municipal comments. That's correct. The, the, the municipal comments were, sh were sh categorized for the town council and was shared with the town council. Okay. I, I have a question about that later. I just want to note a couple things on the revenue. Um, Greeley is already looking into uh, this whole concept of tuition and foreign students and trying to affiliate with Thornton Academy. So there's other activities in the state, people trying to do it, and they've actually made some inroads into it. And secondly, on the various sports fees, there is a lot more than an activity fee. I, I virtually pay for the uniforms for my son. I pay for the shoes, I pay for the pants. A lot of the parents are picking up a lot more than what you described. It's not just the fee to play, it's also... Um, the amount of uniform the schools we use compared to what you have to pay is minuscule. I pay for the majority of the uniform sold to other parents. So just so people can understand, um, the parents are picking up a lot of the tab of, of that. That's my only two quick comments. Thank you, Dave. I had more, but I made it short. Thank you. Could I just, though, comment on one thing? As far as looking at bringing in other students from other places, we are also doing that. We're also in that process, and we all are having contact, as a matter of fact, with uh, some possibilities out of China as well as locally. So we're in that process. I simply said that because if people thought raise their eyebrows, thought that was weird, I just want to let them know there were a lot of other schools considering that. Mm -hmm. While everyone's jumping in, um, there was. Uh, there was Something about a couple of comments on hiring a grant writer. Yeah. Or having a. I didn't, I didn't hear you. I apologize. I was trying to get through it quickly. Uh. Um, yes, grant writing. Yes, there were three comments around grant writing. And I do believe that 
Um, Alan is in discussion with um, the Cape Elizabeth Education Foundation, the Communications to, uh, Committee, um, and a private Cape Elizabeth citizen around the idea of um, helping the district with grant writing. Mm -hmm. uh, I assume that's, that's, you're speaking with Steve about their expertise mm -hmm. in grant writing, not, no, we're not talking about writing grants to Steve, we're no. talking about writing grants to other, other sources. Yes. Okay. Yes. Which is, what we're doing is we're looking at the resources that are out there that we could use as a district in order to come in and do grant writing Great. based on uh, what our needs are and also what monies are available. So we are in that process right now. As a matter of fact, we have a meeting on it next week. Okay, anything else? Okay. Um, under the expenditures um, side for the schools, um, the probably largest area that people commented on was under um, salary and benefits for staff and um, asking whether or not it would be possible for um, uh, salary freezes or, or some, some, some renegotiation of salary and benefits. Um, buses. There was quite a few comments about um, no longer offering bus busing to Cape Elizabeth um, students, um, and it, or on the flip side, on the revenue, which was to charge for it. Um, but there was actually more comments about eliminating busing services. And the state does require a school district to provide public bus transportation for grades K through 8. Um, we two years ago combined the middle school and high school busing. Right. Um, so we now, lo now no longer offer separate busing for the high school. Uh, the school board can set a maximum walking distance. Mm -hmm. um, so that may be an, an area that we can discuss at a later time. I thought it would be interesting to share with you that um, based on the most recent state data, uh, which is the year, fiscal year 2008, Cape Elizabeth's per pupil expenditure for transportation was $357 per pupil, which is below the state average of $570 per pupil. So um, I do think that as a district we uh, enjoy a fairly significant uh, level of efficiency, and a lot of that is due to the fact that um, we share um, personnel and the management of our transportation system with the community services um, program. Um, in 09-10, $625,000 was budgeted for uh, transportation. Um, the cost per student uh, in 09-10 was 366 um, per student. That's a very small increase um, over the previous year. Um, interestingly enough, the EPS formula only allows $297 per student. Makes you wonder how all the other districts in the state of Maine manage to afford their transportation uh, budgets, considering the EPS is below our number and we're below the state average. Um, it's important to note that while the EPS formula allows for $297 per pupil for transportation, we actually receive only 12.5% of that as a result of the funding law, and, uh, which is based on our valuation. Okay. Um, and busing, did anyone mention or have we looked at um, eliminating the late afternoon buses? Uh, there was one question, one, one, one idea about um, charging for the afternoon uh, mm -hmm. late bus. So. Um, that was definitely included in that. Okay. And again, uh, you know, er, these are everything is on the table when we when we meet in the future around the budget. Um, I'm just trying to give you a quick overview because it is a quarter to nine. <coughs> uh, the next was furlough days. Um, there were several suggestions around that. Um, it's important to note that based on our contract and the language, furlough days must be agreed to by the um, uh, teachers' union. Um, under administration, um, a number of suggestions were to review the administrative support structure, um, merging principals K through 8, um, et cetera. Class size, um, a number of people suggested that we look at class size. Uh, educational programs and offerings. 
uh, things like evaluate allied arts to determine which is more central to our mission as a district, uh, right size foreign language for today's world, um, start world language at a higher grade, eliminate or combine electives with low enrollment. Were some of the comments, not all. Um, share, consolidate with other districts. Sharing non-core classes with other districts like shop and languages. Share AP classes with other districts. Consolidate services with other communities. Consolidate purchases with other districts. Send students to paths in Portland. Uh, share special ed. Um, I think that pretty much covers it. Uh, in terms of that, <coughs> the district currently sends nine students to paths. Um, we do participate in group purchasing with um, the State Department for buses. We bid on oil and fuel with the Greater Portland Council of Governments, thank you, um, which we also do for paper products and school office supplies. Group food is purchased through the York and Cumberland County Nutrition Cooperative Purchasing Group. So um, this, in fact, is an area that uh, the Cape Elizabeth has been very aggressive about for a number of years be because we have been under um, financial constraints uh, a number of years earlier than uh, these other districts. But um, just to let our citizens know that this is something that we've been doing for quite a while. Um, review staffing, evaluate all non-teacher positions for necessity, look at the number of guidance counselors, um, do we need to have special ed techs work with more than one student, uh, subcontract out support services like janitorial and food services. Alternative delivery of courses and materials. Use open source software and open source textbooks instead of textbooks. Distance learning for low volume <laughs> courses. Uh, reduce courses that don't meet minimum enrollment in online versions, online courses, etc. cetera. Um, it's, it's good to know, um, well, it's obvious that if you go to uh, e-text or open source software, uh, you will then be required to have laptops or some sort of other technology device in order for students to have access to this information. And um, Gary was kind enough to provide us with some information about what that would cost our district. Uh, to provide all students grades 5 through 12 with laptops through the existing MILTI program, um, that's the uh, state um, computer program that we use for grades 7 and 8, um, the cost would be $240 to, uh, uh, per student per year, and that cost would equal about 850 students in grades 5 through 12, not including the 7th and 8th graders that already have a laptop. And that works out to be roughly well, $206,000 a year. So it's questionable, uh -huh, perhaps, as to whether that would provide the district with uh, savings that we, we would look for this time of year. Um, obviously, there are other um, technology um, um, equipment that could be used, like netbooks or tablet, but um, those have had questionable success in other districts in the state of Maine. It's also interesting to note that e-text cost roughly the same as printed versions. Actually, they cost about $1.25 more per student um, with a six-year site license. So at the moment, e-texts are not necessarily a lot less expensive than the written hardback versions that we've been using um, in our schools for a number of, of decades. Um, we are aware, however, that there are some open source textbook projects that are out there, like in California. Um, which you know would be worth looking at, but I think um, we have the issue of the, the hardware to overcome before we could possibly make that work. Okay, uh, unmandated costs. Review unmandated, unmandated special ed costs. Say no to un unfunded mandates. So there's a, quite a bit of that. I think that was um, along the same lines of, of frustration with the state and, and, and the funding. Uh, purchasing, competitive bid for fuel, school supplies, et cetera, buy group discounts, et cetera, et cetera. Um, for fuel, we do competitive bid with each year. School supplies we purchase through a consortium. Our recycling and disposal fields have been paid by the town with no fee to the school. Um, all report cards are online. No paper copies are sent home. And for the most part, all communication with parents is now 
um, through email um, or electronic. It says electronic communication, there's very little paper communication. So again, this is something that's been instituted for quite a while in our district as a result of um, some earlier um, expenditure pressures. Libraries. There is a number of comments around looking at combining library services either between the middle school and Pond Cove um, and or including the Thomas Memorial Library. Um, there was a number of comments around looking at the calendar school year, uh, looking for a shorter year or a longer day, year-round school calendar, look at a full year school. There was quite a breadth of, of suggestions here. Um, there is the state law requires a minimum of 175 school days for students and 180 for staff. So um, we don't have a lot of flexibility around this issue at the moment, but that perhaps may change given the kind of um, financial pressures the state is experiencing. Can I make one comment on that? That is an unbelievably low number when you look at what we're competing mm -hmm. in this world. And I, I just thought I'd mention it. We're trying to give a great education. And we're, get, we're like 27th in the world, and they're having, they, they would consider 180, 184, 187 days to be a joke. They would easily be over 200. So there was a huge cost to that savings. Thank you, Dan. Okay. Um, athletics and extracurricular uh, reduce offerings of other co curricular and athletic um, programs. Look at athletic expenditures, restrict sports to local venues, restructure athletics, use the same uniform for different sports. Um, okay, that gives a general gist of, of those comments. Uh, just for the public to know, the middle school athletics use the same uniforms through the Cape Elizabeth Community Services and a deposit is required, as I mentioned earlier. Um, the current uniform practice in high school is that uniforms are replaced every five years. Um, and, and as um, David correctly mentioned, um, a great deal of the uniforms are not paid for by the district but are paid for by boosters. Uh, as to who and where we play, it's greatly controlled. Um, and there's a very long explanation about how it is so controlled. I'm just not going to get into tonight. It just goes on and on, and it's really quite nightmarish. Um, but <laughs> it will be this all this information will be um, put together into a report um, and made available online for um, citizens to review at their pleasure um, but needless to say we don't have a lot of control over who and what we play um, if we want to still be in a league um, with meaningful competition energy look at energy expenditures invest money in physical plant to save money uh, turn off every other light, lower the building temperature, calculate utilities. That gives you an idea. Um, energy has been a focus of the districts for a very long time, ever since I've been on, and there is an extensive list of the amount of effort that um, under Ernie McVeigh's leadership has been made. Um, and again, I'm not going to go through the whole list of what has been done. Um, I will say that um, the number of kilowatt hours in uh, 08, 09 was reduced by 215,000 from 07, 08, which is a 10% decrease. So that gives you an indication of the kind of um, savings that we're getting as a result of his work, and we're continuing that work. Um, I do believe that we, are the benef we have been the beneficiary of an efficiency main uh, grant to replace more energy efficient light bulbs, and we are in the process of applying for a federal stimulus money grant to continue work along in that line. Uh, under food services, it said eliminate jobs in the cafeteria, use bad lunches, raise fees, uh, make money in the cafeteria, etc. Um, the state controls how much the district can charge for a lunch. We actually have to um, ask them to approve the price that we charge the students and they control, there's a percentage increase that they um, make us um, stick to for the most part. Um, the number of choices offered in the lunch program have been reduced. They're serving one less entree per day in this year than they did last year. Um, it will be interesting to note that uh, an average for the year to date for our food cost per meal is 63 cents in food and $2.10 in labor. 
In comparison, South Portland is 80 cents for food and $2.41 in labor. Scarborough is $1.24 in food and $2.25 in labor. Um, so we actually compare very well to other districts. And if I noted the other day that we um, try to have our food service program be um, self-sufficient, whereas the Portland School District actually, I believe, has a $2 million, is that correct? It's a fairly large I, 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 I should not say $2 million. It's, I don't know what it is. A it's, a, it's a large amount of money that they actually have in their budget to support their food services program. It should be also mentioned that, like in South Portland, uh, they pay, they pay uh, health insurance on the staff, so it isn't included in it. So there are, there are different ways of doing it in other districts. Right, okay. Um, custodial services. Well, there was a couple of very interesting comments around um, following a Japanese model, which the students and families take on custodial duties and clean their buildings themselves. Um, there's, there's a number of <laughs> comments around consolidating schools with uh, K through eight, and um, I think for that. This is the sort. Okay. Any questions? Last comment. I have to admit, um, I wrote the Japanese. I'm one of two people who wrote the Japanese. And you um, the I did. I think my children should. <laughs> you are the children. Did I make a couple of comments? I think that was an excellent summary on your part. Yes. On, on a very long, complicated, and I, I particularly like how in certain areas you had a lot of data to explain to, to the public how much Cape really is doing. I've talked to school board in, in Yarmouth, Falmouth, and Greeley, and they're, they're all over us trying to borrow our model for them, and they get more state money than we do. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I think people in this town ought to realize how much we, we're already doing. It's not to say that we can't you know, take a look at other things and, and do, do better. There's, there's no system made by man that doesn't have some inefficiencies in it. But people have to realize that we've done a lot in this town over the years, and parents are paying a fairly significant portion uh, of the school costs as opposed to the town as a whole. There was a couple of things at the conclusions that I thought were interesting, and I looked at the larger one. I was pleasantly surprised by the number of people, given what I thought was the general makeup of that group, that supported higher taxes if they thought they were getting their return for, whether it was to maintain the high quality we have, uh, whether they were assured that uh, people were doing the best they could. But I was very pleasantly surprised. Even in my group, which is one of the tougher groups, the majority of the people supported higher taxes it, because essentially what we're trying to do is maintain what we have. We're not trying to balloon up and add courses and make ourselves better. We're just trying to maintain what we have. And we got hit blindsided, as I used when I was in school, and was stabbed in the back of the state of Maine with some fairly significant cuts, they're balancing their budget on us. And we're trying to make up for it. it's not. So I just think people have to realize, and I was very pleasantly surprised by the number of people, Republicans, Democrats, across the board, that seem to be acknowledged that, given the amount that we're facing, that we're going to have to increase taxes, but they want to be assured it's the best bang for the buck. I agree with you. I, I want to make sure it's the best bang for the buck. Otherwise, I won't increase it or I won't ask, I won't vote for it. Uh, the other thing that you didn't mention that I, I'm surprised, because I thought this was an ad hoc, and it's not being critical, but it was an ad hoc committee. I read through it, and there was a lot of support for the concept of one town, that the town generate revenue to support the schools, because we are one town. We're just a part of the municipality of Cape Elizabeth. We don't stand alone. We may have a separate budget. We are one town. And there was a lot of people who were looking at various revenue sources in the town on the idea that they're going to use that money to help support the schools. Whether you agree with it or not, that was, I, I counted in almost every group. And that, again, thought was very encouraging. I know some people don't like that idea. I do, because I think it is one town. And when I, as a taxpayer, whether you take it out of my pocket or whether you take it out of, and I'd rather have it taken out of Fort Williams fees than out of my pocket. But when you take it out of one pocket to pay for schools, you take it out of my pocket to pay for this ballot, it's still coming out of my pocket one way or the other. And I was very pleased by the group while we had disagreements with that municipal side of that. There's a lot of people looking 
for the municipality, which is the school department, to try to find ways to work together. And that's the first time I've seen that in 10 years. And I just wanted to say that I, I was very pleased by that. Thank you, David. Anybody else? Question. Um, the, some of the facts that you quoted, yes. which was in response to some of the suggestions, yes. are those facts on the web as well? They're not currently on the web. Um, I just got this data uh, yesterday afternoon. Um, and so I hope to put this in a more presentable packet for Alan to review, and then we will put it on the website. Because I think that would be helpful yep. for those who yep. didn't see tonight but yep. might see the web. There's a whole series of links, and this will, this will be yet one more for, for people to have access to. Um, and, thank you. No, thank you, Kathy. And also, I think um, probably this would be a good time to talk about what the next step is around the curtailment. Um, and as chair of finance committee, maybe you want to. Sure. Um, you may notice in the back of your packet that the um, finance committee is going to meet with respect to the curtailment um, Monday, January 18th at 7 p.m. in the Jordan Conference Room. That is a holiday, but um, we, have, we have use of the room. So um, we will be discussing then the curtailment for this school year, which is the $621,000 that the state's cutting from this budget. And we'll be listening to um, uh, Alan's plan for how he wants to deal with it and having a discussion about um, the school board's support or changes for that plan. I'd also like to mention that this Thursday at 1 o'clock in Augusta, the Appropriations Committee will be receiving testimony from um, citizens uh, around the curtailment um, in education. Uh, and I believe Alan is going to be attending that uh, meeting. And um, what I would like to suggest he, that he bring up copies of our resolution that we voted on and approved um, last fall if, that we um, issued as a result of the curtailment to have available to the committee members um, on our behalf. Could I make an additional suggestion, having worked with grassroots organizations dealing with that state legislature over the school consolidation? I would encourage every citizen in this town to email their state reps, but all state reps. You, it's a little bit hard to do, but you do it. They, um, as I was trained by Mary Ann Lynch, uh, formerly of the town council, was a lobbyist. They actually read emails, and to them, 40 or 50 emails on a point is an avalanche of letters. And so this is really where town people can get involved. And it isn't helpful to just complain. It is helpful to point out inequities, point out suggestions, point out resolutions. But legislators, um, a classic example is we're getting cut 30 plus million dollars in the Department of Education. Last time I heard it was going to cut 15,000 and now they're cutting another 200,000, which is simply on uh, an almost on definition, but it's something about uh, relationships. They're not, we're cutting people all over the state potentially, and they're not cutting anybody. I mean, these are sorts of things legislators can sink their teeth into at the state legislature. DOE is passing it all down to us, yet they're keeping the same enormous bureaucracy. And that's probably one of the points I'm going to put in mind, but I strongly suggest every citizen take a look at this and find out what they can, ask us questions, but to write an email. And write it to the Education Committee, especially every member of the Education Committee in our own state reps. It does actually make a difference. It's surprising, but it does. And the Appropriations Committee. Thank you. And um, one other thing. Uh, question. Are we allowed to write emails in, should we do it as citizens? Or citizens. It? Okay. It, it's appropriate to mention that you are on the school board, but that I'm you're not, writing as well, a citizen. I know I can't represent right. as the school board. Can right. I thank mm -hmm. you? And the other thing I wanted to thank um, Kathy for is I was getting a little worried when I, when I seen the town council having all these meetings on finances. And I'm glad to see that we're, I appreciate that we're now starting to do the heavy lifting ourselves with at least two meetings in January. I'm glad. I'm glad to see that. Thanks, Kathy. Okay, so moving on to item 7D, which is a consideration to approve the 
Uh, board chair sign an acknowledgment letter for David Hillman specific to his personal individual service to the Cape Elizabeth School Board. Um, do you have a motion? I move. <laughs> <laughs> Second. <laughs> Can I, can I just do the quick explanation of why that's there? Well, can you make a motion? I did. Should oh, I'm sorry. So moved. That's should right. Should be making the motion? So I, I, I don't. Yeah. Like yeah. Go ahead. Would somebody like to make the motion, please? Other than David. I make the motion to approve David Hillman as a school board member. Well, actually, it's to act for the chairman to, to sign the letter on behalf of the school board. Mm -hmm. As the chairman to sign the letter on behalf of the school board. <laughs> Is there a second? Second. All right. David? It, it's, it's, a, it's a technicality, but an important technicality of my firm. Um, in a nutshell, it says when I'm serving on this board, you guys, everybody understands that I'm not providing legal opinion, I'm not providing legal advice, although I tend to sound like I am, I am not. <laughs> Uh, and I, I, I know that everybody's going to get legitimately uh, like to see me squirm over this one. But it's actually very important to me personally and very important to my firm. It's required in my firm. Yeah. We're one of the few firms required, but every alas insured firm has this requirement. And the reason is my insurance does not cover me if I was to give legal <coughs> advice to this board because I'm you know, not my client and I personally would prefer to uh, that we rely on our own counsel and not me. And so what this is an acknowledgement that when I provide advice, it's as a citizen and not professional advice as an attorney. And therefore I'm covered, not covered under my firm policy, but I am covered under the town policy. But I'm not rendering legal advice. Any other comments or questions? Okay. All in favor? Six, Five, zero. Okay, thank you, David. All right, last um, is 7E, consideration to approve middle school robotics team travel request to Texas, April 22nd to the 24th. At the very end of your package, you have that letter dated in December of 2009. Uh, what it is is we have two middle school students who have qualified for the World Vax uh, Robotics Championship, which will be held in Dallas, Texas. Uh, what, the background is that they have participated in the program with them there, who is a high school teacher uh, and also does our robotics. Uh, they attended meet last spring at the University of Maine Arno and were competitive. This November they redesigned their robot and attended a meet at Boston University. They were the only middle school team among all high school teams. Uh, the boys finished third, but more importantly, we're awarded the Excellence Award for Outstanding Design, Programming, and Sportsmanship. And this qualified them for the World Championship. Uh, the boys have also uh, taught at the Community Services Robotics course for third and fourth graders and for fifth and sixth grade classes. Uh, they're committing to furthering their knowledge of robotics and passing their that passion and knowledge on how on onto the younger students. And I would comment that I've watched them both, and they are very enthusiastic about what they do. They would like to attend this. Uh, uh, Championship, which is in Dallas on April 21st to the 25th. The comp competition will, the competition will be, will be, I guess that's supposed to be will, be at the Dallas Convention Center and uh, VAX has arranged discounted hotel fees. Uh, they hope to have a coach accompany the boys and both families of Luke and Anthony will be attending as well. Estimated cost of the trip, including the $500 registration fee, will be around $4,000. This includes the three participants' airfare, hotel, meals, transfer, and shipping the robot. At this time, it is hoped that Cape Elizabeth High School senior and volunteer robotics coach, Jack Queenie's schedule will allow him to travel to Dallas as well. Uh, and in anticipation of that, they have uh, planned to do fundraising, and they comment on some of the fundraising that they're planning to do there. Uh, <laughs> I like the part. <laughs> I like how it says after attending two craft fairs and selling to family and friends, the boys have sold more than 180 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you may have put that line in, I'm not sure. But anyway, in addition, they are writing grants in order to find that amount of money. So their request is, is that they be allowed to uh, take the boys on this four-day trip uh, to represent themselves in the World Championship. 
I don't know. We are proud owners of one of those bugs. Oh, good. Oh, no. You should write its name. What's it do? Display it. It moves around explain. like a bug. <laughs> oh. It does. It's what it's sensor based. If it feels you there, it will move and turn around. And, and this is all privately funded. This is, this is all. Yeah. This is no cost to the school. Yeah, we'll no cost to the school. <laughs> <laughs> right. okay, do I have a motion for um, item 7E? I move that we approve the middle school robotics team travel request to Texas April 22nd through the 24th of 2010. Is there a second? I'll second. Any questions or comments? All those in favor? Okay. Um, anybody feel the need to report on any committee meetings? Um, I better. Um, okay. Uh, communications committee has been busy this week. We've had um, morning coffees in the schools to introduce the faculty and staff to our new school board members. Uh, we had a coffee at Pond Cove um, on Monday morning that was well attended and then this morning um, at the middle school. We will be rescheduling the high school coffee. Um, that was scheduled for tomorrow. Um, we'll reschedule that and put that on the web as soon as possible. But I would like to thank um, Andrea Fuller for her participation in that. She really helped do a lot of the organizing and Peter Esposito for um, supplying us with the, the coffee and, um, and then everyone who attended um, and um, the administration for um, promoting and, um, I think they've been um, really a good opportunity for the new school board members to get a sense of um, the faculty and staff and um, what they do and their responsibilities. And um, so I would encourage any school board member to come to the high school when we, um, when we reschedule that meeting. And communications will be having, our committee will be meeting tomorrow as well at 3. Anybody else? Uh, public comment on agenda items, school board agenda requests. Um, could I just say one more thing? And I just wanted to thank you, Rebecca, for all of that work. I didn't get a chance to say it because you didn't ask for additional comments. But um, that was a lot of work on your part to pull that committee together and to lead them through a, a pretty daunting task um, and I thought you did a beautiful job facilitating that evening session and really pulling together some great information so thank you for doing that you know particularly during the holiday season when it's you know a difficult time to get people to pull their schedules together so I thought you did a really exemplary job well thank, thank you, you to the 90 citizens who came that was really a, an amazing evening um, and quite an um, outstanding process so but thank you very okay uh, announcement of upcoming meetings uh, we have them at the bottom of our agenda but they can also be found on the calendar on the town website and um, is there somebody who'd like to make a motion for adjournment before we do that I wanted to say something to end on a light note <laughs> there is a word that I absolutely hate it's overused it's called transparency and Newsweek announced this week yeah. that it has made the list of words <laughs> no longer to be used because their annoyance level exceeds right. the value of the words. <laughs> and I wholly concur in that. <laughs> Newsweek. Thank you, David. Is there a motion for adjournment? So move. Is there a second? <laughs> second. All those in favor? Aye. Okay, 6 -0. Thank you, everyone.